evening. Thank you for joining our presentation this evening, uh, Benefits of Native Plants. We are uh, Tarrant County Master Gardeners. I'm Nancy Curl. I'm one of the hosts this evening. And before we begin with our presenter, Ann Knudsen, and her presentation, let's hear a word from TRWD about water conservation. The Tarrant County Master Gardener Association has partnered with the Tarrant Regional Water District to encourage water conservation. TRWD maintains four area lakes and pipelines needed to provide surface water to local water treatment plants so they can clean that water to meet drinking standards for our communities. They also work with many cities in Tarrant County, such as Fort Worth, Arlington, Mansfield, and many others to provide water conservation programs to the community. Conservation is an important water supply strategy to help meet the needs of our growing population. There are currently 2.3 million people living in Tarrant County and is expected to double over the next 50 years. At SaveTarrantWater.com, you can sign up for free weekly watering advice custom to your location. If you're a resident of Tarrant County, you can sign up for a free sprinklers checkup where a licensed irrigator comes to your home, provides a comprehensive evaluation of your system with recommendations to reduce water waste. There's also an event calendar where you can find information about future classes and workshops. So be sure and check out SaveTarrantWater.com to sign up for their free services. Uh, let's move forward with our presentation this evening, and I am delighted to introduce Ann Knudsen. She is a Texan from birth. Her interest in native plants grew from playing in the wildflower fields of her youth and her mother's love of gardening. Ann is a master naturalist, a master gardener, and an active member of the North Central Chapter of the Native Plant Society of Texas. She's been involved with InSpot's landscaping certification program. Wally Holler, her mentor, and Anne took many UT-sponsored classes through the LBJ Wildflower Center and InSpot. When Molly retired after nearly 25 years as coordinator for the Molly Holler Wildscape, she asked Anne to fill that position. Anne's business, Native Gardener, has specialized since 2007 in native landscape and design. May I present Ann Newton? Good evening. I'm here to talk about the benefits of native plants, and which are, there are many, some you may not even realize. And so how are they beneficial? They're beneficial in so many ways, and these are the three main topics I will be covering. If you look at this slide, the slide, uh, part on the left, which is a Texas Parks and Wildlife graphic, pretty much reflects what's on the satellite image on the right. You can see our because our state is so large, it has many different ecosystems. You can see on the right how much greener it is in the west eastern part of the state as compared to the western part of the state. There are different soils, different rain, and so that's why there are so many ecosystems. And this reflects the average rainfall that Texas gets, which is part of that ecosystem's diversity. If you go to look at the right side of the state, the eastern part of the state, you see how that gets so much more rain than the western part of the state. As much as 60 inches in the far east of average rainfall, and you go, as it goes west, you gradually decrease the rainfall, average rainfall a year, whereas at the very tip of the western part of the state, you get maybe as much as 10 inches of rain, which is that's a pretty drastic difference. The reason why native plants are stronger and healthier is because they've evolved with those different ecosystems from the soil to the rainfall difference and the topography of the state. And evolving so, They've developed deep root systems and they've learned to work with the animal species that are in that ecosystem. When you say deep root systems, I'm talking pretty darn deep. You look at the far, far left, that little plant there, that's a typical urban landscape turf grass, which is an exotic. And you look at the far right, that's a native turf grass or buffalo grass. It gets as much as eight feet deep, so you can see why that would be a tougher grass and would tolerate much uh, more diverse weather than that little grass over on the far left where the 
root systems don't even get a foot. And all those plants in between are, are plants that we can use in our native landscape. They get as much as 15 feet. And in some cases, some of those grasses, the bunch grasses can get up to 17 or even 18 feet deep. Now look at these typical urban landscapes. I know y'all have all seen these or something similar to these where I doubt any of these plants reach near that depth root system. So what happens is the water that lands on the landscape, a lot of that just runs off. It doesn't take it down into the soil. And with that water goes anything that's put on that landscape, such as uh, pesticides, herbicides, and chemical fertilizers. All that goes down into our watershed. Look over here on the top left. You can see how that water would just run straight off. And all these, and if it's on a slope, like uh, this one on the bottom left appears, it's on a slight slope that water runs down even quicker. Now, imagine you're some kind of wildlife looking for food or shelter. Well, if it's in the winter and you go to this one on the top left, you're really out of luck. There's nothing there for you and very little in the other three. Maybe a little bit for shelter, but not much for food. So you can imagine how, uh, unattractive that those landscapes would be for wildlife. Now, on contrast, you plant native plants and they will come. As I said earlier, the native fauna animals evolved with the plants. The plants provide what they need to survive and vice versa. As I said, the native plants provide what the animal life needs. In fact, they prefer the native plants over any invasive plants because they know somehow that those native plants provide exactly what they need. Such as the little gulf fritillary, this orange butterfly over here on the left, this one right here, that's on the lantana. When it's presented with the choice of the, a native passion vine or an exotic passion vine, it always chooses the native passion vine to lay her eggs on because that's the, the chemicals and, and nutrients in that vine are exactly what her caterpillars need. Not only do they provide better, exotics can be detrimental. To, to our fauna. Take the cedar waxwing, this beautiful bird here eating the berry. It's a ver voracious berry eater. It will, and during migration, just devour every berry it can get its hands on or beak on. When there aren't any native berries around, they'll eat whatever berries are available. And in our landscapes, a lot of those berries are Nandina berries. And Nandinas carry, uh, contain in them a lot of cyanide com compounds. And when those cedar waxwings eat enough of those berries, which inevitably they will, if that's all that is available, they it can kill them. And at the very least, weaken them greatly. So that's, that's something to, to uh, be concerned with. So now that we know native plants help our, our native fauna, yeah. let's go over other ways that it helps the environment. As I said, those deep roots will help with the uh, plants being able to require less water because less water it's the water is taken deep into the soil, so water is not evaporated or run, run off the landscape. So it has reservoirs deep in the soil of water. It also stops and slows down erosion because it takes that water deep into the soil. 
and taking that water deep in the soil helps recharge our aquifers and by, as it takes it down into the soil, it's cleaning the water and improving the water quality. It also takes the carbon in the air deep into the soil, improving uh, our air quality by taking that carbon and other air pollutants down. And we all know how important sequestering carbon is to our uh, global climate change. Those root systems Health. keeping the plant healthy. And that makes them healthy environment by them continuing to live on. Because they've evolved with the landscape, their ecosystem, they're used to whatever comes along. So they don't need chemical pesticides because once you have the animals coming in, any pests that come in are taken, by, taken care of by, say, the birds. You get a bug on your plant, birds come and eat it don't need chemical fertilizers because they they are used to and evolved with the soil that was provided them. And contrast, exotics not only don't help with our animal life or our natural uh, landscapes, they can be detrimental. We've spent, as you can see, billions and millions of dollars uh, to, to get rid of the invasive exotics. Some of the most egregious exotics are privet, which was brought over because it's such a beautiful plant, it is, but it can be spread across our natural areas and agricultural areas so that it chokes out any native plant. You All you have to do is go along the highway to see some of these invasive exotic plants and they've taken over. Especially in the spring, you can notice the privet all along natural areas, just deep into the uh, wooded areas. And once that takes a hold, nothing else can grow. Which, as I said before, our native uh, wildlife needs our native species and they can't find them if the exotics take place its place. Other invasive exotics are Bermuda, um, Johnson grass, which you see all along the highway, Japanese honeysuckle, which can choke out uh, a lot of different native plants by twining around. Okay, other benefits of our native plants is because you use those instead of uh, the, say, the just the, in the lawn. If you buffalo grass only gets about six inches tall, so you don't have to mow it. You can, but you don't have to. And there's little or no edging because that's of that same reason. When you put a, the right bush in what, uh, a space, you don't need to hedge it. Or yopon. It's a great plant, and I see it hedged all the time. But if you don't hedge it, it has it's a natural uh, has its own natural shape that's very becoming. It it's dense. It's not a ball or a square if it's not hedged, but it's a nice clump of shrub. It has a nice shape, and if you hedge a plant, birds typically see that as a wall and so will not go into that plant and use it for shelter or even try to eat the berries. Native plants don't need fertilizer. You could use a little compost, sure. That's great for any plant, but fertilizers are not needed. We've discussed how much less water is used, so you don't need to add a lot of water to our native plants. You can, if it starts looking a little wilty in, in drought, yes. But once they are established, you do not need to add any additional water. So you got a lot of savings in all of those. Mowing, if you don't need to mow, you don't need to edge, you don't need to pay somebody to do that, or buy the machines yourself, or take care of those machines and, and their maintenance. And of course, water 
and fertilizer, obviously you don't need to pay for that. Our native plants are used to extreme conditions. So when we're hit with these odd uh, events that come along, like the one in February, where we were sitting in our houses trying to cope with several degrees, uh, several days under freezing weather, and many of those days in single digits, uh, our plants were surviving that. We've also had other types of extreme weather where in like 1980 and 19 and 2011, we've had extreme heat. Of, in 1980, we had 69 days of over 100 degree heat. We had close to that in 2011 and a lot of dry uh, and, and no rain. Whereas in the last few years, we've had heavy rain in the first part of the year through spring as much as our annual rainfall, average annual rainfall by the end of May, and then followed by a dry summer where we had hardly any rainfall. And that those plants went into shock. So what happens? This. I'm sure all of y'all have noticed around town that a lot of shrubbery has either died completely or gone or just hit really hard. So people are going to replace these plants, and of course that costs money, and it's going to take years for them to get back to the size and uh, that these exotics were. So if you look on this plant uh, picture on the left, you can see how these plants behind this Indian hawthorn that bit the dust are, are looking nice and green. Those are native plants over here on the behind on the left is American Beautyberry and in the middle behind is uh, our native Hawthorne, not Hawthorne, excuse me, uh, Yopon and back over here on the right is a wax myrtle. All good native shrubs. Another benefit is whenever you go into a native landscape you can have a sense of place. You feel like those plants belong. You can go in the eastern part of the states and know that you're in the piney woods. Go in the hill country, like in the middle here, and you can feel that that's part of the hill country. All the way out into Lubbock, over here on the right. You know where you are based on the native plants. It's shown by lots of different studies that being near living near or living in a natural area can provide a sense of peace it helps lower your blood pressure and uh, feels makes you feel less stressed which overall those things help your physical and your mental health well using native landscaping can help do that for you because one of the things it does is bring nature home to you. As you can see, these little boys are really enjoying the butterflies that are fluttering all around this Greg's Blue Mist and being delighted. Remember those earlier landscapes I showed? You can imagine that those landscapes don't change much throughout the year. They're pretty much static. You know, I'm sure we've all seen uh, landscapes that have maybe have a, uh, some color with annuals and the rest is shrubs, a tree, lawn, and those annuals are the same throughout the years. Staying, they don't change. It's the same from year to year and, and the landscape through se from season to season changes very little. Well, with native landscapes, you have something going on all the time. From sp spring, early spring, when, when some of the trees are blooming, and then going in through the summer, uh, where all the per perennials are blooming at different times. One blooms after another blooms, bringing in all the pollinators. And 
through fall with the new berries coming on and into the winter where you get the berries on uh, the shrubs during the winter. So there's something going on with the plants themselves, but not only with the plants themselves, but with the nature that it brings in from the butterflies and bees and other activity there to the birds capturing some of those insects that are attracted by the, the plants and of course lizards and, and all kinds of stuff coming in. So that makes it very interesting to be out there looking at what's going on. Our native plants provide a lot of different textures too, like this agave plant. Uh, it provides kind of a sculptural feeling to it, like also other cactuses do here, which has sculptural look to it. And other that go from that sculptural look to a softer look of the cedar sedge and horse herb that just has a different feel to it. And then you have all kinds of different textures, like the swaying of the basket flowers that are these taller flowers in the back that almost look like thistles but are not, to these giant cone flowers that have the big huge leaves here that when during the winter it has a, a nice rosette of leaves that kind of remind me of a cabbage and then you have these spiky looking little spotted bee bombs that provide different interest. There's all kinds of different plants that give different feel to, to uh, your landscape. Then we have some native grasses. This is just a sample and they provide color and texture and movement when they're in the wind, a breeze and they're just flowing. It's like almost like being on a surf where you have the water going in and out. And when they're backlit, they're really spectacular in the evening or morning. The Indian grass had these golden little uh, inflorescence that when the light hits them, it looks like gold glistening in the wind. And then what does everybody really want? Color, 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 and we've got it from all these beautiful white plants, white flowers here. Yes, white is a color. To different pinks. And different reds. More pinkies, pinks and purple. Yet more. And more going into bluish colors. And just out of interest, this is a Texas wisteria, not a Chinese wisteria. The way you can tell uh, Chinese and Texas wisteria apart is Texas wisteria does not bring down structures, but also the uh, Texas wisteria will bloom after the leaves come out, whereas Chinese wisteria blooms before the leaves come out in the spring. And our yellows, which there are many. See how did the yellows attract different interesting little uh, native bees. This little green bee down here. And even more, it's amazing how many different colors of yellow there are. And some oranges. Okay. Another qu question that I get often is, how do I get grass to grow under my shade trees? Well, my usual answer is not to limb up the tree, which can cause damage if you do it too much, or to put in a, an exotic turf grass that's shade tolerant. Not only uh, is that, in my opinion, not a good idea, but often does not give the homeowner what they desire, because those 
so-called tolerant shade grasses don't thicken up the way they think they should. So what I usually tell people is why not try a ground cover? It's, it's much easier to deal with. You don't have to mow it. You can mow some of them like this horse herb or frog fruit to make it look more like a lawn if that's what you prefer, but you don't have to. Even if you do mow it, you don't have to mow it nearly as often, especially if you mow it on your higher side. Not only do they provide a nice look, they also attract all kinds of uh, other insects like little butterflies and the frog fruit here the one on the left attracts the common buckeye to it and where it acts as a host plant for this common buckeye butterfly this beautiful little butterfly down here and then there are different kinds of ground covers all different kinds just think of what ground cover means to you ground cover doesn't necessarily mean something low and flat it simply means it covers a large space of ground like this coral berry here this shrubby ground cover gets up up to maybe three or four feet normally and has a nice airy feel about it when it's all nice and green and then in the winter it has these beautiful berries that last through most of the winter and then there's scarlet sage over here on the right where you can leave it to its natural height like this one is at the top on the top picture where it gets about one foot or so i mean excuse me two feet tall maybe or you can keep it at about a foot where it looks more level and it has a more formal look and it will produce these beautiful red flowers that attract butterflies and hummingbirds it's just, I was so excited the first time I noticed a little hummingbird on my scarlet sage. And there's a few more. And these are evergreen. Something that a lot of people desire. Now, lawns don't provide evergreen color, but these do. Like this lyre leaf sage here that when it's blooming in this mass, it's just beautiful. This pretty blue purple color and then after it blooms you can cut those uh, bloom heads off and you have this nice rosette with with the leaves have purple vanation that's so interesting i think you don't have to cut those seed heads off in fact the seed heads themselves look very interesting but that means you'll have more, more of that then you have over here on the right golden groundsel that blooms once a year, usually in late February, early March, which attracts the early pollinators. And then the bloom stalks go up about 18 or so inches and have these tiny little grouping of yellow dandelion like flowers. Then it finishes blooming. You can either cut it down, cut the stalks off, or let them just go off uh, naturally. And then after that, you have a nice little evergreen ground cover that reminds me a little bit of a juga, where it has these ovate leaves. And then there's cedar sedge. This nice soft look here with this kind of grass-like. That you don't have to measure great ground covers for the show. People want to know what their lawn's going to look like, what their yard's going to look like, and that's up to you. You can use your imagination and have it whatever way you want, just like in a, uh, any other landscape. You can have it look very wild, like this picture on the left, or this picture on the right, where it's a little has she has uh, lots of different flower beds and then she has a huge lawn which you don't see the lawn back here as much but there is a huge lawn back there you can have ones that invite you in so that it just pulls you into that landscape this arch helps with the pathway leading you into a bench over here where you can sit and enjoy all the activity going on in your yard and this one on the right by the pathway here those stones help bring you in and lead you to the front door where there is a bit of a lawn in between where she's got lots of different little 
beds around the tree. There's more examples of, of beds and lawns. Beds, nice pops of color to that green lawn. And if you make that lawn a buffalo grass lawn, if you can, then that's all the better. Then you can have your own private little oasis. This house faces west, so she wanted to have something to complement those big post oaks. So we have coral berry here, all under the oak trees, and that helps uh, shade the house and makes it much cooler in the summer. And then she has a little bit of a formal look here with the soft buffalo grass, a little bit of sedge right here where it's a little shadier. And then over to the right is black dahlia, which is really pretty when it's blooming. And then over to the le far left, right next to the driveway, she has a flower bed. So that when you drive up, you, have, you get a pop of color there. And just on the other side of all these, this coral berry and the trees, between the house and that is this nice little patio area where she can sit and enjoy the flower beds across from this patio area. And most of all, your yard will be beautiful, attracting all kinds of animals, color, like I said, changing all the time. And it just provides a beautiful backdrop to sit and enjoy, or at least even if you don't get outside when it's hot or too cold, you can look out the window and enjoy what's going on rather than a, a desert of a typical urban yard. So now that you must have all these native plants, you want to know where to get them. Well, now many of our native plants are available in the local nursery trade. Even in the big box stores, you can find a few. If you're going to go to a nur uh, nursery, I would go to a local nursery because they're more apt to have native plants that are grown closer to home, which is important because genetics are different than ones that were grown in California. So the closer to home, the better. Not only can you get them there, but through uh, Native Plant Society, Master Gardener, uh, even native gardens like uh, city gardens like the Molly Hollow Wild Sky, yeah, yeah. other na uh, native plant gardens in your local towns that will have a plant sale. So pay attention to local yeah. social media and you will find plant sales usually in the spring and in the you fall. You can get acquire them as to volunteer uh, for p plant rescues with Native Plant Society. Oftentimes they will say that they're having a rescue because something is going to be bulldozed to make way for new homes or a new business. And you can volunteer for, uh, like I said, those natural gardens. Often the volunteer, when there's too much of any one plant, they will share those plants. And of course, if you have friends that like native plants, usually people who are crazy about native plants want to share. So those are good ways to get native plants of your own. You want to learn more about native plants to help you know what, what plants will be good for you for your particular landscape. The native Plant Society has native landscaping certification program. That doesn't mean you have to be want to be a professional in native plants. It just it are classes for anyone, whether you be have no knowledge at all, or you're a lands professional landscaper and want to gain more knowledge about native land uh, plants. So you can check out what uh, programs are available, which classes are available by going on their website. It'll tell you if you go onto the state website what ch chapters are having those classes. Right now they are available through Zoom classes, but uh, they will be having live classes when all this COVID stuff is If over. you join your local chapter of Native Plant Society, you'll gain a lot of knowledge going to their meetings. You don't have to go to their meetings. You can just join look up what they have available on their websites, but if you get, and you will get the state newsletter and the local, your chapter's local newsletter via email. 
So you'll get a lot of information that way. But if you join the meetings, they have uh, a, someone talking on a topic that's about native plants, and they're all, almost always interesting, is that if you join the North Central chapter of Native Plant Society as a new member, you will get your choice of a book of a Ali and Andy Wasowski book called Native Plants Landscaping Region by Region, or Michael Eason's Wildflower book, which are both wonderful books. Volunteering at a public native garden, not only can you get plants, extra plants, uh, free plants sometimes, but you'll gain knowledge of uh, how plants are used, what the characteristics of certain plants are, and of course, not only by the hands-on experience dealing with them, but from the other volunteers telling you their experiences with those plants. And it's always nice to, feels good to, to help your city. Out. Native Texas Plants, uh, Landscaping Region by Region is the book I just mentioned. That has all kinds of good information in it that will help you in your own landscape. It gives you uh, the plants, it, the way it's organized is by the type of plant, like shrub, ground cover, perennials, trees, and it tells you what where that plant is normally found in its native habitat. So like something from the Trans-Pecos West Texas area or from the hill country, it'll tell you where it's from. And it tells you what those needs are for that plant, how to take care of it. So it's a very good resource. Now that doesn't mean it has every native plant in there. It's just a, a kind of a jumping off point to help you in your land. Bringing Nature Home is a wonderful book telling you why native plants and how that it all works with the ecosystem. It has uh, Doug Tallamy has good stories in there to help you understand. And he tells about a, uh, I'm not sure if I read this in the book or if I listened to him tell this at a talk I attended, but talks about how a, a couple he knows had bought a piece of property that they loved because of all the nature all around them. And then they went and built their home. And what did they do? They put in that typical urban landscape and all that, all the animals, all the wildlife disappeared. And so they went to him asking him what they could do to bring them back. And he says, well, bring back those native plants. Replace that, that turf grass replace that they did was just drive the wildlife away so is the the plants that he has listed in the back of the book are the ones that are native to his area which is up in the northeast which i believe is around pennsylvania in pennsylvania it's a good book to to check out some other resources the wildflower center has their own page wildflower.org and if you go to you go to their home page it has this little menu bar where it says native plants you click on that and what comes up is you can look up native plants by uh, the name or by its characteristics or you can put in characteristics of a plant you want and it'll give you a, a list of possibilities or it also gives you lists of plants for your region so you can find plants that way it's all kinds of information you can even ask Mr. Smarty Plants questions and he will get back to you, he or she. Uh, so it's, a, it's full of information there. Plus they have pictures. Um, now, don't always, the pictures that are on there, most of them are taken out in the wild and by, by amateur photographers with not the best lighting. So sometimes they're hard to see. So once you find a plant that you think might be interested and check out other web pages that might have pictures of the plant so you can get a better idea of what it might look like. And then other, another source that I really enjoy is Texas Flora. It's a Facebook group page. You do not have to belong to that page, but uh, if you want to post or comment on anybody's post, you have to be a member and all you do is ask them to join 
unless you've done something really terrible, I doubt that they would reject the you. The people that are on there are anywhere from people don't even know what a plant is hardly to people who know every little bit detail of what a plant is from all the botanic uh, names of the parts of the plant. Yeah. Experts really have a lot of knowledge to, and they, they love to help. And it's fun to see what people across the staff have in their parts of the state because it's different from where you are. It's just wonderful to see what's available out there too. And people love to give advice and, and give suggestions. So it, it's a beautiful source. And they have, there are some people that have the most beautiful pictures on there uh, of the plant. Now I've come to the end. And one last question, one that I'd like to put to you is that when do you think this landscape picture was taken? Uh, you may not believe it, but there it is. Here's my contact information. And I hope you go and start enjoying the natural areas around your part of the world and start putting some in your own little yard. Thank you.